body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined by my producer, Joel. And today, we are diving back into the wonderful world of aliens. But in this episode, we're going to be covering a specific aspect to the whole alien issue that doesn't get talked about a lot because a lot of people are very skeptical that aliens exist which in these days i'm like i feel like that number is decreasing by by the minute because i think most people are starting to wrap their heads around the fact that we are most likely not alone in the universe i mean there's trillions and billions of galaxies there's probably there could be an infinite number of planets like earth out there where life could exist and maybe life exists in other ways that we're not even aware of now so this idea that aliens exist and potentially we've been visited by them is one of those questions that really fascinates me personally i mean i'm really really into ufology and just this whole idea that we have been visited by extraterrestrials potentially since the very beginning of time and so while they've been here you know what have they been doing Well, one of the things that people out there believe is that potentially some of these alien races may be here to experiment on humans. And why would they do that, you might ask? Well, maybe they're interested in how our DNA works. I mean, we are very complex beings. The fact that sort of, you know, you start from this tiny little seed of a being to grow into this full-blown, very complex organism is truly amazing and maybe there's something special about humans that other alien species would be interested in you know whether it's learning about us or just sort of observing us and our behaviors so so in the past we've talked about aliens before we've talked about alien abductions before and we've briefly talked about aliens experimenting on humans through some of these abduction stories Well, today we're going to be talking about an individual named Roger Lear, and he was a doctor who actually claimed to remove alien implants from some of his patients. So he believes that aliens abducted these individuals or just, you know, while they're sleeping, implanted these different types of devices or pieces of what look like just everyday metals or something we're not even sure where it came from potentially for whatever reason and so these patients visited roger lear and he really became sort of the expert on alien implants i don't know about you but the idea that while you're sleeping potentially an alien might have either abducted you and then just erased your memory or while you were sleeping probed you inserted something into your body in order to track you collect data on you is kind of a terrifying thing to wrap your head around. It really is. Because it's very possible that it could be happening. And there's a lot of people out there that have reported waking up with very bizarre injuries that they're like, how the hell did I get these scratches or these marks? Or, you know, they straight up are like, there's this thing under my skin. I can see it, but there's no way that I did this to myself. There's nothing I would have came in contact that would have even looked like that that now ended up embedded into my my body. And this is such a taboo subject. I mean, so many people are so skeptical about this idea of aliens probing, but there's actually a decent amount of evidence for some type of extraterrestrial species or perhaps artificial species that could be working in conjunction with the government, you know, top secret programs, things like that, where they are doing DNA sort of analysis on human beings and they're trying to reverse engineer maybe to create some sort of hybrid species of like human alien mm-hmm. or maybe trying to clone. I mean, there's so many possibilities here, but the fact that there's actually a substantial amount of evidence to suggest this, that there are extraterrestrials that perhaps are testing on us or implanting things in our bodies is kind of terrifying. Yeah, and lots of the stories we've covered in the past, like a similarity most of them had when they were brought on board the ship was they were yep. put on like a, a gurney or an something. operating table or something. There you go. So, so, you know, a lot of people have these, you know, self-proclaimed experiences and they remember it or they don't remember it. And then through hypnosis and other forms of therapy, they're able to, rec- you know, recollect these yeah. memories of of being implanted with things or being tested on with different things it's it's way more than you would think and you know some people just like to say oh it's just a bunch of 
of bullshit. It's just, you know, people making up stories. But I think there's way too many cases for it to just be a bunch of bullshit. I think yeah. there is something to this world of aliens and alien implants. So, And most of the, the people do, who do have sightings are able to draw it out most of the yeah, time. Yeah. And give you at least a visual of what they saw. Totally. So that alone is like good evidence. Yeah, I mean, just the whole fact that the government now acknowledges that UFOs are real, that we don't know what they are. We don't know what's piloting them. It appears that these craft are not from this planet, that we don't have any known technology created by humans that matches up with the capabilities of of these UFOs that are flying around. And I think the fact that the UFO subject continues to you know rear its head here time and time again is very interesting. But it seems like people still, for the most part, don't really care. Like they're still like, oh, you know, that's cool that there's mm. UFOs, but like they're not actually thinking about well, what does that mean? Right. Does that mean that we're not alone, that there are some other type of species here on the planet other than human beings that's intelligent, that has technology that far surpasses what we have right now? I mean, I think that's something we all have to really like consider mm. and, and prepare for because it could be any day now that, you know, we find out for sure, you know, the alien lands on the White House lawn right? and all of a sudden we're seeing these beings that don't look like us or yeah. maybe they do look like us. And they're like, yeah, we're from Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah, we just got right. here. Or, you know, who knows how they'll communicate. Maybe it'll be telepathic, most likely. But just this whole concept to me is so fascinating. And and it's kind of it's kind of spooky at the same time because it's something that's completely unknown to us. We don't really know what this means. And I mean, there's people that for years and years and years have claimed to have been abducted, have claimed to have stuff implanted into them. So these are all topics that I find super interesting and hopefully you do too. And that's why we are going to be uncovering what Dr. Lear has found in his career when it comes to alien implant victims. But this episode of Lights Out Podcast is brought to you by Higher Love Wellness, which is my company. And I'll tell you more about that later, but that is our sole sponsor for today. But let's go ahead and just jump right into things and find out what Dr. Lear discovered during his years long career as the alien implant doctor. In the search for inarguable proof of extraterrestrials, both believers and non-believers agree on one thing, crossing the aisle and talking about aliens, implants, abductions, or UFOs is considered taboo. To talk about an abduction story to a non-believer is near impossible to do without looking like a fool. Because there's no middle ground when it comes to experiences with extraterrestrials unless, of course, you find yourself with like-minded believers. Sometimes the only agreement between opposites when it comes to the vast dimension of space is that it's really, really big, and we've barely explored a fraction of it. The universe as we know it is nearly 93 billion light years from end to end, which means it would take something traveling at the speed of light 93 billion years to travel across the entire expanse of the universe and who knows if it even ends there because even then the universe is constantly expanding so by the time that thing has traveled 93 billion light years it would have many more light years to go knowing this as we look up at the night sky its endless shining stars evoke infinite thought what is the architecture of our universe how did we come to be and are we alone? These questions can be exhausting the more you think about them, but in the end, we have to consider that our planet is just a blip on the map of the universe. How likely is it that the Earth is the only place inside 93 billion light years of space that can sustain intelligent life? It's daunting to think about what could be out there, especially when our ideas of aliens often come from movies. And on the big screen, the extraterrestrial life forms almost look terrifying. Have you ever seen District 9? Terrifying. Yeah. And even the aliens in War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise, those are some scary-ass aliens. Yeah, man. yeah, they're always scary in, in Hollywood. I feel yeah. like they always have giant heads and massive eyeballs. Right. And they traverse the stars in their flying saucers, scooping up people with their abduction beams. And mm -hmm. then they experiment and probe on their subjects with horrific tools. Or if you're Travis Walton <laughs> with real tools. Yeah. <laughs> but our views on aliens are constantly shaped by these fictional stories. And they're often fueled by our fear of the unknown. 
These myths and legends are based on our own imaginations, and not much of it is grounded in hard scientific proof. But many researchers out there are trying to bridge the gap between fiction and truth. The biggest challenge these researchers face is establishing credibility. Not many are willing to suspend their disbelief when it comes to aliens and UFOs, and not many are willing to put their careers on the line when trying to prove the discovery of intelligent life beyond our own. So many are searching for physical evidence in the field of ufology, and they want to understand the highly detailed engineering of our universe. And among these researchers was a man named Roger Lear. Roger was born on March 20th, 1935 in San Francisco, California, and he attended the University of Southern California and graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1961. In 1964, he received his doctorate in podiatric surgery. He continued his medical career as a foot surgeon and often came across patients seeking relief in their legs or feet. And along the way, his interest in extraterrestrial life began to unfold. As he looked at the stars, he knew that each one would be its own sun or planet, and he wondered about the possibility of intelligent life existing in those other solar systems. Knowing he would risk his reputation, Roger became fascinated with the idea of possible alien experimentation on humans. And not long after becoming a foot surgeon, he joined a local chapter at the Mutual UFO Network known as MUFON, but kept his interests separate from his professional work. And it wasn't until the 1990s when his interest in alien life crossed over to his professional career. Extraterrestrial theory surged in the 90s with the input from Bob Lazar. His theories on alien technology involved things like alien spacecraft, antimatter reactors, and synthetic chemical elements. Bob Lazar placed Area 51 under the spotlight when he claimed it to be a research facility where the government kept secrets of alien technology. And although his claims didn't hold much water, to the masses, organizations like MUFON gained interest in discovering alien technology. UFOs, abductions, and probings became much more mainstream topics. And during this time of peak interest, Dr. Roger Lear became absorbed in the concept of what he called non-terrestrial experimentation on man, or more specifically, alien implants. And so began his search for alien abductees. Within the network of other ufologists, Roger came across a man named Daryl Sims. He was a certified hypnotherapist and a member of the Houston chapter of MUFON. And after his son was abducted when he was five years old, Daryl Sims began offering counseling sessions to other abductees free of charge. Knowing the trauma his son had gone through, Daryl was willing to help any other victims of alien abductions. And over the years, he built a long list of clientele. And when Roger made contact with Daryl, he knew there would be a large pool of abductees to pick from. Daryl suggested that those who thought they were probed should get x-rays to confirm if they had implants. And those who ended up having a foreign object inside of them were directed to Roger. Even though he was a podiatrist and his professional focus was on the feet, he accepted patients who had foreign objects anywhere in the body. Both Dr. Lear and Daryl Sims were in agreement about the implants and they both searched for the hard scientific evidence that could prove the existence of non-terrestrial life. And not only that, but non-terrestrial life that actively observed or manipulated humans. This was the evidence that Roger would call the smoking gun. Soon, their first two abductees volunteered for surgery. Each had an x-ray examination which showed one patient having an object in their big toe and the other having an object in between their thumb and index finger. On August 19, 1995, both patients were scheduled for surgery. Along with the x-rays, Roger used ultrasound to confirm where the objects were. And most of the time, they were a piece of metal no bigger than a BB pellet. Sometimes they were as small as a pinhead. So these surgeries needed to be done in incredible accuracy. Roger cut through the skin closest to where the foreign object was planted with a small surgical knife. Then he used surgical forceps. This tool looked like scissors, but instead of blades, they had small pinchers at the end. He used this tool to find and remove the object, and if he was close, he could feel the piece of metal right away. And depending on how long the piece of metal had been inside the person, sometimes he had to dig through a bit of tissue so he could find it. The objects were so small sometimes that they were tough to find, 
But by the end of the day, Roger had successfully removed the two metal objects inside the abductees. He also kept a bit of the human tissue that surrounded the object to test how it interacted with the body. But now that Roger had his first two samples, his plan was to run them through a series of tests to determine what they were made of. Roger believed these tests would be their pathway to proof, but it would also be their biggest setback. The tests they wanted to conduct on foreign objects were extremely expensive, plus there were a lot of tests to be done. In addition to the x-rays and surgeries, Roger also wanted pathology tissue evaluations from two independent pathologists. They would study the human tissue just outside of the object to see how it reacted to it. Then he wanted tests done to see if any electromagnetic activity came from the object itself. And on top of all that, he wanted to test the metal and see what it was made of. All of these tests took years to finish, and the cost quickly added up. So Roger and Daryl created a nonprofit organization to continue their research. It was called the Fund for Interactive Research in Space Technology. But before they started the organization, Roger was very worried about his reputation as a doctor. The subjects of UFOs and aliens were taboo in the realm of science and research, and he considered using an alias until he could confirm the implants were actually non-terrestrial material. But in the end, he knew that would just take way too long. And if they wanted to continue their studies, Roger knew he had to start making some noise and drawing attention to their work if they were ever going to get enough funding. So he made his name public and told the UFO community what they had been working on. He was confident that the tests would reveal something non-terrestrial. And after years of research, their tests on one of the objects finally came back. According to Roger and Daryl, the foreign object they had extracted from their patient revealed quite a lot. The pathology test showed that the metal object was coated in a membrane of biological tissue. And they suspected that the purpose of the membrane was so the patient's body wouldn't detect it has a foreign object. And all along the membrane were tiny nerve fibers sticking out, and Daryl claimed that these fibers were connected to larger fibers in the patient's body. As for the tests of the metal itself, Roger claimed that some of the elements within the object were meteoric. It consisted of 11 different elements, and Roger concluded that the object was non-terrestrial. Before they extracted the object, he also used a radio frequency meter to see if the object transmitted anything. They claimed to have picked up a few small radio waves, suggesting that the object might have been transmitting some sort of information. After releasing their findings to the public, Dr. Lear and Daryl Sims were thrown into stardom. The UFO community became obsessed with their discoveries, and Roger became the frontrunner in the search of physical evidence that supported the existence of alien intelligence. Their discoveries had gone mainstream. Dr. Lear soon made his way to TV shows and radio interviews. Coast to Coast AM, a national late-night radio talk show, welcomed Roger several times. From then on, his work came under the media spotlight. But with all this fame, backlash quickly formed. Skeptics in the scientific community accused Roger and Daryl of exaggerating, misinterpreting, or lying about the results. Many of their biggest critics claimed that the objects were most likely fragments from everyday objects. The patients likely stepped on a metal object, or had a minor carpentry accident that they barely remembered. And the radio transmissions that Dr. Lear had detected were just background frequencies from nearby phones, TVs, or radios. And in the end, their findings weren't enough to convince anyone outside of the UFO community. It hadn't been the clear-cut smoking gun that Roger was looking for, but despite the criticism, Roger kept going with his work. And throughout the course of his work, Roger worked on a total of 17 abductee patients, and he believed 16 of them had been implanted with alien technology. Although these tiny metal fragments were challenging to understand, Roger thought the implants were some sort of nanotechnology. As far as Roger could tell, this technology was far beyond our understanding, and it was way more advanced than anything we've created on Earth. And as for their purpose, he believed the extraterrestrial's goal was to collect data from abductees. He thought the implants were somehow connected to an extraterrestrial supercomputer, and that the abductees were also connected somehow. He suspected the aliens were interested in traversing space and time, or maybe they wanted a way to dimensionally shift into our reality. He also believed the aliens were especially interested in human sperm, and Roger thought that they wanted to collect samples in hopes of doing something genetic. But Dr. Lear could only speculate. 
Anything more was a mystery. Well, you're absolutely correct. Uh, people have been looking for physical evidence for years. You know, where's the Holy Grail? Uh, is it a piece of the Roswell craft or a piece of something else? Well, as you mentioned, this, this is a physical object which you can not only hold in your hand, but you can dissect in many different ways, both biologically and metallurgically, and you can come up with some factual information. So we, we look at these things, and as any scientific effort would do, you look at them from the outside in. So we look at them macroscopically, you know, what do they look like? Uh, seven or little metallic rods that are about uh, well, maybe six millimeters in length and about the thickness of a pencil lead, and they're covered with this very strange gray sort of biological coating that you can't cut through with a surgical blade. Wow. And then come to find out that this, uh, the surrounding tissue shows no rejection or inflammatory reaction to the object. Well, that's, as far as we know, as, as medical people, is virtually impossible. That's pretty profound. As for each individual implant, none of them looked similar. Each was unique to their specific patient. Some looked like they had properties similar to a crystal and others looked like tiny metal beads. Some even had mysterious abilities. During his operation on patient 15, the abductee believed he had an implant in his toe. He said he woke up one day and noticed blood spots on his bed sheets, and he suffered extreme pain in a specific area in his toe. So he went to see Dr. Lear, and after an examination, he found a metal object in the man's finger, even though the pain had been in his toe. The man had no recollection of ever being wounded on his hand. And after further examination, Roger discovered that the object was a tiny piece of metal, and there was no trace of any wound. Roger recommended his patient have surgery to remove the piece of metal, and it wasn't until a follow-up visit when the patient finally told Roger about being an abductee. He had told him about multiple abduction experiences, and he even claimed that his wife and children were also abducted at one point. He said the aliens had followed him around for most of his life, and he feared they had implanted something inside of him. He quickly agreed to have surgery, though, and Roger always used an x-ray during the operation that produced a live image of the object during extraction. After he had made his first cut and began searching for the tiny piece of metal, Roger experienced something that he had never seen before in any of his patients. Before he could grab the object, he saw that the piece of metal broke into several different parts on the x-ray feed. He then had to extract each tiny fragment separately. And after removing each piece, he placed the metal on a sanitary cloth and coated each piece with a preservative. As he went to remove the last one, it completely disappeared. He couldn't see it in the patient's finger, and he couldn't see it on the x-ray. He searched for a very long time, but in the end, he gave up. The last tiny piece of metal was lost. He took the parts he had successfully removed and put them into a container. And three days later, when he wanted to continue his research on the pieces of metal, he opened up the container and noticed that all the separate fragments had actually come together in a single file line. Out of his own curiosity, he closed the lid and shook the container so that the pieces separated again and then set it on the table for 15 minutes. And again, he opened the container and noticed that all the pieces had come together. There was some sort of magnetic force at work between the pieces. Several more times he shook the container and every time the samples came back together. Roger even took video footage of the strange phenomenon. And in the end, he concluded that the pieces of metal had a magnetic memory between them. This was the only time Roger had ever seen anything like this before. Another strange occurrence happened with patient 16. Although it had nothing to do with his implant, most abductees can only remember small bits and pieces of their abduction story due to the belief that aliens wiped their abductees' memories. But patient 16 suggested he remembered most of his story. He had gone on a camping trip with two of his friends, and they had set up camp and the sun had set. They stayed up late and talked around the fire, but eventually they all became tired. They had set up their tent so that they could see the night sky as they laid down in their sleeping bags. 
And as they dozed off, they looked into the clear night sky and watched the stars. When suddenly, one of the boys spotted something unusual. He pointed out to the others, and each of them saw a bright light growing bigger and bigger. They thought it was from a giant star, but when they noticed it, it was some sort of aircraft with a massive light coming from it. A cone of bright blue light shot down at the boys, and it pulled them from their tent. They began levitating slowly towards the aircraft, but none of them were afraid. If anything, they were having a great time flying around. They were brought into the bottom opening of the ship, and once they entered, they found themselves in a large circular room. Several creatures greeted them. They were described as slender, black-eyed creatures with gray skin. They had large heads, and they communicated with the boys without opening their mouths. The creatures told them not to be afraid. They then separated the boys and led them each into different rooms. Patient 16 described the room as a hospital room, and he claimed that the creatures had injected something into his leg, but he felt no pain at all. After the quick operation, the boys were reunited in the large circular room. In an instant, they were beamed back to their campsite. They noticed the sun was beginning to rise, and the ship had disappeared from the sky. The boys felt immediately hungry and went on to find a nearby vegetable garden. They pulled the fresh vegetables from the ground and began devouring them as if they were starving. And years after this, Roger eventually successfully removed the piece of metal from this patient's leg. But alongside his work as a doctor, Roger also researched other alien events around the world that involved alien sightings and potential implants. And that's when Dr. Lear's research took him to the notorious UFO crash landing in Varginha, Brazil. Before we continue with our story, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. As you probably know from listening to Lights Out, you've heard me talk about my CBD company called Higher Love Wellness. Well, Higher Love Wellness is sponsoring this episode of Lights Out Podcast, and I would love for you to check us out. So if you're new to the whole CBD world, CBD is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid from the hemp plant, which is 100% legal here in the United States and in many places around the world. The difference between CBD, and you've probably heard of THC before, which is found in the marijuana plant, is that CBD does not get you high at all. It does not have that psychoactive component to it, so it can be used pretty much whenever you want, which is what I love about CBD. As somebody who uses both, I love CBD for during the work day because one of the, some of the effects that CBD has, if you're not familiar with it, is it can just help your overall mood because CBD actually works with the receptors of your endocannabinoid system in your body, which regulates mood, appetite, sleep, and CBD works with that to help that system work more efficiently and really enhances some of the effects. Like I take CBD before I go to bed. Personally, I feel like I get much better sleep. I have better dreams. I feel like I fall asleep faster and I stay asleep longer when I use CBD. But during the day at work, one of my favorite things to do is take advantage of our CBD dabs, which here in front of me, I have our pineapple express CBD wax. And if you're not familiar with what wax is, wax is just a concentrated form of CBD. So in the actual wax itself, there's about a thousand milligrams just under that of CBD in it. So what you do is you use this amazing Turt pen that we sell, which is the device that you need in order to do a CBD dab. And we make these in our cool color. It's got our logo on it. But what I love about this setup is that it is very, very mobile friendly. You can take this anywhere. You can take it to work, have it in your car. And all you have to do, pull the cap off. And this thing's got basically little ceramic coils on it. And all you do is breathe in through the mouthpiece, it heats up the coils, and then you just lightly apply the coils to your CBD wax ever so gently, and you kind of dab it, which is why it's called a CBD dab. You kind of dab it up and down. I'll demonstrate here. And you take a nice dab. Nice. Delicious. This Pineapple Express has just got such like fruity tones to it. It tastes good. It smells good. 
and it's not harsh on the lungs. There's no additives. It's not like vaping. It's very different from that. You're heating up this natural compound and you're basically just breathing in. You're still, I guess you're still vaping it, but it's not through an aerosolized solution like a normal vape cartridge would be. And what's great is that you just put the cap on this, finish up the remnants of it and you're good to go. And a dab will, is probably the most effective way to, to consume CBD. You're gonna feel the effects of it almost immediately. And for me, it just makes me feel more mellow, more chill. Sometimes it can make you feel a little tired depending on how much you do, but it's a great way to sort of just take the edge off without like incapacitating yourself to where you're just like high or stoned or something like that. So at Higher Level Wellness, we sell a couple different uh, flavors of wax. We got the Pineapple Express, the Blueberry OG, and then we have a Watermelon Haze as well. They're all delicious. All of our products are made here in Colorado with hemp grown here in Colorado as well. It's all extracted from a place that I go to personally. And what's great about my company is that this is a small business. This is a family business. It's my wife and I that own it. There's no outside investors. So when you buy from us, you're literally supporting our family, our friends that work for us. And we're a small crew. We do it all ourselves. And I would love for you to check it out. We've also got gummies. We've got two different blends of gummies. The gummies are a great way to consume CBD. I usually do gummies in the morning and at night. And then we have oils, which are also great to just take under the tongue, or you can put them into drinks. And we're gonna be working on a bunch of different stuff, hopefully some pet products coming soon for those doggos and, and cats out there, among other things that we've got coming. We've also got great topical, a great uh, salve, which is great for just topical relief. CBD can help reduce inflammation. It can help, uh, help you with anxiety. There's a lot of benefits to it that makes it a really great product if you're looking for something to just help mail you out maybe help you with pain relief things like that cbd can definitely help you out with that so if you're interested in checking out higher love wellness it's higherlovewellness.com and you can use code lights out for 10 percent off your order and right now we just started shipping to the uk and we ship to new zealand and mexico as well right now we're working to uh, send to other countries unfortunately canada does not allow any sort of CBD product to be imported from the United States right now, which is awesome. So we can't send anything to you guys up in Canada yet, but we're working on some other countries as well. But right now it's all 50 states. Again, this is 100% legal. What's great about our stuff too is there's no THC in it. So you never have to worry about getting in trouble with it. If you were to get stopped by somebody or, or a cop were to take it from you, they could test this and there'd be absolutely no THC in it when it comes back, which we have our tests on our website. So there's no worries there. You don't have to worry about any sort of legal issues with our products. It's all safe. It's all 100% legal and you can get it shipped to all 50 states. So again, check out higherlovewellness.com and use code lights out for 10% off your order today. Alongside his work as a doctor. Dr. Roger Lear also researched other alien events around the world that involved alien sightings and potential alien implants. In 2005, he published a book concerning the notorious UFO crash landing in Virginia, Brazil. And in the mid-90s, several alien sightings plus at least one UFO caught the attention of the entire UFO community. Supposedly, a UFO had crashed near the city and several of the aliens aboard the spaceship roamed around the town. The first sighting was on January 20th, 1996. Two sisters and their friend were walking through town one day, and as they rounded a corner, they spotted a dark creature in the middle of the road. It walked on two legs, though, but it wobbled back and forth. The creature looked disoriented, and when they got closer, they saw that it had a giant head, a slender body, and V-shaped feet. Its skin was brown, and when it came under direct sunlight, it looked like the outside of a human heart. It was filled with veins, and the whole body pulsed. Massive veins pumped through each arm, and on its head were enormous red eyes, and it had three horns on its head. The sisters claimed that the creature appeared to be in some sort of pain, but they were afraid to get any closer to it. It also reeked and made strange noises. So the girls quickly ran home and told their mother about what they had seen. After describing the creature, their mother looked at them with fear in her eyes, and she told them 
that they had seen the devil. She told her daughters to stay put, and she went out to look for herself. When she came back to the spot, her daughters had claimed to see the creature. She smelled something nasty in the air, but nothing was around her. She only saw a few footprints in the dirt and a stray dog smelling the ground. After this, rumors quickly spread throughout the city of an alien sighting. Although the official report claimed that the girls had only seen a local mentally handicapped homeless man covered in mud, but regardless, the sisters still believed that they had seen some sort of extraterrestrial creature. Just two days later, locals spotted another creature in town. This one appeared unconscious and was found on the side of the road, but no detailed descriptions were reported. Allegedly, not long after it was first spotted, three military trucks arrived at the scene and took whatever this body was away. According to rumors, one of the soldiers that retrieved the body mysteriously died a few days later. Another creature was spotted by a janitor that worked at the local zoo. He spotted the creature after the zoo had closed and could barely make out what it was. But he was sure that it wasn't human. What's really weird is that over the next three months, three of the zoo's animals died, and many say that the unknown creature that they had seen had caused it. Another sighting was of a UFO. A local farmer claimed he had seen a spaceship hovering over his cattle farm for nearly 40 minutes. As Roger studied all these various cases, his interests were drawn towards the bodies taken by the military. He actually interviewed two witnesses that claimed the creatures had been taken to medical clinics and studied. But eventually, the Brazilian government intervened and took the bodies away. But that didn't stop Dr. Lear from publishing his book titled UFO Crash in Brazil in 2005. But throughout his studies and involvement in the UFO community, Roger mainly focused on his implant patients. None were as controversial as his 17th patient. He was a man in his 40s who had a scattered memory of his abduction experiences, which was very common in abductees. Many can't remember their abduction because it's believed that their memories are wiped almost entirely by their abductors. His first encounter with aliens happened when he was just a child. He remembered a bright blue light coming from his windows and several great creatures appearing in his bedroom. He didn't know why they were there, but he suspected their intentions were evil, as they gave off an ominous presence as they hovered around his bed. His parents had put high locks on the exterior doors so that he couldn't unlock them as they didn't want him to accidentally drown himself in the backyard pool. But that night, his parents found him outside in his nightgown, and all of the doors were still locked. And all he remembered was that the strange creatures had put him in a trance. Sometimes he could break out of the trance, but it was incredibly hard. He believed that through their telepathic ability, they could control him and block his memories. He had no recollection of the actual abduction, but he did have a faint memory of a strange force pulling him into the air. Years later, when he was in his 40s, he was riding his motorcycle when a sharp pain set into his leg. When he pulled over to the side of the road, he looked at it, and there was no wound or blood that he could see, but the pain was excruciating. And this was how he eventually found Dr. Roger Lear. But when Roger told patient 17 that his pain could possibly be coming from an implant, he had a crisis of faith. Patient 17 was a Christian man, and he believed that if what they found in his leg was an alien implant, then that would cause him to question the existence of God. Patient 17 had an open mind, but he feared what the doctor said. All of his friends and family were highly religious, and he really couldn't talk to any of them about his experience. The discussions of aliens and alien abductions were taboo within his church, but at least he figured he had a community of people to discuss his situation. When he found Dr. Roger Lear, he no longer felt alone. He could finally tell his abduction story to someone that wouldn't look at him like a complete lunatic. And it was a breath of fresh air to finally find a community that was open to the idea of alien activity. And after having some discussions with Dr. Lear, patient 17 felt more comfortable about having his leg checked out. They x-rayed his leg and found a small object in his calf. It looked like the foreign object was partially embedded into his shin bone. After a series of tests, the object was confirmed to be metal, and several more tests followed. Dr. Lear used a Gauss meter, 
and detected a small amount of magnetic activity coming from this piece of metal. After locating the object with an ultrasound and a stud finder, patient 17 was ready for surgery. Several UFO enthusiasts had caught wind of Dr. Roger Lear's next surgery, and while he made his first small cut into patient 17's leg, many people gathered in the waiting room. Many had cameras and a list of questions, but none were allowed into the patient's room. After cutting open his leg, Dr. Lear dug around for the piece of metal, which he finally found trapped in a cluster of tissue. As he removed it, he kept a bit of the tissue attached to the object as he had always done. He told patient 17 that it would take months to have the tissue and the metal tested. The surgery went by quickly, and when patient 17 was ready to leave, the UFO enthusiasts had crowded the waiting room. One of the staff members guided patient 17 towards the back door so he could dodge them, and Dr. Lear carefully stored the sample in a container so he could study it later. The first study on this metal object was done with an electron microscope, and with this, Roger saw the metal and the tissue up close. As he and his team studied the object in detail, Roger suspected it could have been a carbon nanotube. The series of black and white ridges looked like nothing to the naked eye. But Roger claimed the object might have similarities with other nanotechnologies that he had seen throughout the years. But nothing could be confirmed until more tests could be done by other experts. So the sample was sent to several different labs that tested the metal and the biological tissue that was attached to it. But before these tests were ever completed, Dr. Roger Lear's health declined rapidly. And on March 14th, 2014, Roger died of a heart attack at age 78 years old. Websites, radio shows, and podcasts across the nation praised Dr. Lear's work. And the UFO community suffered a great loss. But the staff that had worked so closely with Dr. Lear and Patient 17 wouldn't let all of the work go to waste. So they continued on. And after months of precise testing, the results of the metal finally came back. 36 elements were found in total. This is much more than a regular iron nail, which only has a few. Even the most complex alloys have around five different metals or oxides. But the metal found in patient 17's leg was complex iron alloy that was also nearly 25% meteoric iron, which means that some of the iron could have potentially come from beyond Earth. The results were then studied by a nanophysicist known as Nanoman, or Chris H. Cooper. And Chris concluded that the metal had to have been created by some form of non-terrestrial intelligence. He claimed that the zinc sample found in the metal did not come from our solar system. When comparing the metal found in the object to metal found on Earth, he pointed out that the isotopic ratios were far too different. These ratios are what help us identify what a molecular compound is made of. And he claimed that the ratios were so different that the metal must have been formed in a supernova far outside of our solar system. Despite these findings, though, many researchers say that we need more tests on the metals. Many say that the results are inconclusive or anomalous, and many still believe that the metal is simply just a common metal found in our day-to-day -day lives. And despite Dr. Lear's best efforts, he never found his undeniable smoking gun. But many believed his work opened up the doorway to much more research in ufology. Dr. Roger Lear left behind a legacy that would be remembered forever in the UFO community. He was one of the first to bridge the gap between first-hand accounts and raw scientific evidence. This is what the UFO community lacked the most, and Dr. Lear was the first to work towards something real. He may have never found conclusive evidence, and his work has been scrutinized by many, but he cut a path for more research and more funding in hopes that we could find out whatever is out there. And although he never truly understood the purpose of his alleged implants, he began to understand the connections between each patient. He once compared his work in ufology to the composition of a grand piece of music, and in his later years, Roger began playing the organ, and his understanding of music helped him understand his scientific research. Much like the mystery of unknown origins and endless questions raised by his research, music was the same way. And just like one note by itself doesn't make sense until all the notes come together in complete musical composition, 
there is much we still don't know about life beyond our planet. And Dr. Roger Lear dedicated his life's work to piece together the first few notes in the grand composition of alien life. It's hard to say at the end of the day what he really found in these patients. I mean, I think in patient 17, based on the findings by the nanophysicists that this metal was potentially made outside of our solar system is very interesting. And this isn't the only piece of metal that's been found with these types of isotopic ratios where there's just no way this occurred naturally here on Earth. And some of the alloys in, in it aren't even found or known to planet Earth. So it's like, it's hard to deny that evidence. Yeah. Like, it's hard to just say, I, I get some of it is likely probably common objects. Because if you think about it, like, you get stuff on your skin all the time. You're touching stuff. I know I've gotten splinters yeah. where it's like doesn't hurt, but then it just like ends up under my skin and I see it under there for a while. And then eventually like I dig it out. So it's very possible that yeah. like nails or like little things like that. Well, it's, it's interesting how many elements that little piece of metal has. Right. You know? Right. That's what's so weird. That's just really bizarre. Most have a couple or five. Yeah. But this had way, way more than that. Right, right. But what is the purpose of this object? And I think that's the hard thing. It's like, what, if it was some sort of alien implant, then what is it doing? It's an interesting place to be inserted into the body was on the his, leg. The yeah. leg. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, very odd. Like, but it could be some type of super technology able to monitor, you know, the entire human body and no matter what spot they put it in. Right, right. As long as it's sort of implanted into the tissue, mm -hmm. perhaps it interacts with the tissue in some way or the nervous system. I mean, nanotechnology is really, really fascinating. Yeah. And the, the leaps and bounds we've made as humans in nanotechnology is crazy. I mean, the robots that are used for surgeries mm -hmm. these days, and they're working on little tiny robots that can literally go through your veins. Oh, yeah. And like unclog arteries and stuff like the, the future is going to be that like nanotechnology yeah. is going to be the future. And just another example, how far the, the phone has come, yeah. how, how much smaller they can make it. Yeah, exactly. It's just the, the computer chip just gets smarter and smarter and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense that some sort of extraterrestrial species that travels here from some other galaxy or solar system would have the technology or capability to create some sort of nanotechnology that is that they use to implant or study yeah. us for per, you know whatever purpose they they may have well on another note i found it super suspicious that dr lear died of a heart attack at what like 78 and first thing that came across my mind was if these implants truly were like an extraterrestrial type of technology and they did have like a gps system where they can pinpoint the exact location of that um, makes me curious like or were they thinking like why is all of our <laughs> implants at one location and dr lears is over here hoarding it all like maybe the the aliens kind of kind of put a target on his head because they're like what's this guy doing we this don't guy's trying to spoil our secrets yeah here. could be i mean i mean for all we know it could be something like that well here's a theory too so the aliens that like this is just based on what i've learned about potential alien species and and ufology is the aliens responsible for the this genetic testing and implants is a species known as the grays yeah and because the descriptions are always very similar to what we think these aliens look like which is like the big heads big bulgy eyes they're kind of creepy looking yeah they're, they're gray in color hairless and it seems like those are the aliens also most commonly reported in alien abduction stories mm -hmm. as well. And they're always the ones doing the probing. And there's, there's a lot of people in the ufology community that believe the grays are an artificial being that they're not, not necessarily extraterrestrial, but in fact they were made here or perhaps a type of alien similar to the grays crash landed here years and years ago. And then, government scientists and, and special programs mm -hmm. were able to sort of create clones or create artificial 
beings that look like gray aliens and they use those to do their dirty work basically and and because like the other scenario here is is that maybe these individuals are you know they think it's aliens because that's what the government wants you to think but in yeah. fact it's actually the government and we're talking like on you know black ops programs we're talking about yeah. like very like top secret you know unacknowledged right. programs <laughs> where they are doing genetic testing on human DNA, they're mm -hmm. harvesting whatever, you know, information or perhaps genetic information from humans in order to do some sort of like crossbreeding between these gray aliens. Yeah. I mean, it, it gets wild. There's so many possibilities. No, that's interesting because, you know, in past stories that we've seen, apparently some of these abductees witnessed, you know, human-like beings. So that's an interesting point about it could just be like projections of aliens created by our own race to just kind of cover up right. what's actually happening. That's the most trippy thing to oh, think about. Yeah, it is. Because that could be the real possibility. It's like uh -huh. as much as we want to think it's an, a species from light years away doing yeah. experiments like this, to me it seems too human-like. Uh -huh. It'd be very human-like to like insert a piece of metal into a human yeah. being in order to track us or you know everybody's scared about microchips and things like mm -hmm. that it'd be seems more likely to me that this is some sort of like top secret human experiment yeah where maybe they're using these artificial beings or you know or just creating the illusion that it's aliens because we're used to that right. we're used to hearing about alien abductions so aliens doing implants too why not but in fact it could be strictly humans doing it i mean who yeah. knows it, it's really one of those like there's not a ton of evidence for it so it's hard to like pinpoint what it could be for mm -hmm. sure but the i mean the amount of theories out there is crazy there's yeah, so many I different bet. possibilities of what this could be but i thought dr roger lear was interesting because he is like he is reputable mm -hmm. he's an actual podiatrist so he's smart and he knows what he's talking about and so as much as some people would be skeptical and be like, oh, well, this is about fame and money for him and which he he got a little bit of that out of this. But like he also did this from his pure fascination of yeah. alien life and these abductee stories that mm -hmm. he was hearing. Well, in a sense, he was like a pioneer for the totally. alien implant. Type oh, of yeah. I mean, he was the only one really taking this question seriously. And I don't even know who sort of picked up his work from from after he yeah. died but and, it's, and i don't think for him it was all about fame or money because he, he he was smart he would know like once he puts this information out here how many people are going to look at him and yeah he's crazy exactly and i so, mean that's the first thing that happens in the scientific community is if you come out with something that is not backed up by 100 percent concrete proof you're going to get labeled a pseudoscientist yeah. i mean it really is detrimental to your career to your reputation so it's like why put your neck out on the line if you're not absolutely certain in, mm -hmm. in the work that you're doing and what you believe about the work that you're doing? And so rather than just dismiss people like Dr. Lear, I think it's important to look at it and make it make it up for yourself. Like, what do you think? Do you think his work was legit or was is it just kind of like pseudoscience? Like, yeah. is he just like trying to lend credibility to this fantasy of aliens and alien abductions. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say whether or not these people's stories are true or not, but a lot of them like Travis Walton can to this day, their stories never changed. Yep. It's always the exact same things that happens. I mean, he's told his story a million times and you always get the same version of events and the things that he experienced definitely kind of fall in line with the research yeah. that Dr. Lear was doing. If you're interested in, in hearing more about Dr. Lear and maybe even seeing some more of the the evidence, there is actually a documentary called Patient 17 uh, done by Jeremy Corbell, I believe. Uh, that's out there on uh, Amazon Prime Video. It's pretty good. There's You definitely get to get to know Dr. Lear a little bit more. And this episode will make a lot, a lot more sense to you after listening to this and watching that. But it's definitely a good one to check out. We'll put a link for it below. But yeah, you'll have to let us know what you think about the alien implants. Do you think that the objects he took out of people's bodies were some type of alien or extraterrestrial implant or object from 
uh, somewhere else besides Earth, or are these just a bunch of common day objects that were mistaken for something else? I would definitely love to know your thoughts, but that is where we'll wrap up today's episode of Lights Out. I know this was a bit of a different one, but after after those Wineville chicken coop murders, man, yeah. I needed a little bit of a mental break after that. Absolutely. I mean, that's such a rough one to to get through. So kind of change it up a little bit here with some some aliens. Got to love some alien talk sometimes. For sure. But if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, let us know. Make sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. We'd really appreciate it. Leave us a rating or review if you are feeling kind. But we will see you guys next week with another episode of Lights Out. And until then, Lights Out, everybody.